Next on uh, will be Ivan Križan, machine learning engineer at Crows AI. Ivan is a machine learning engineer with three years of experience in learning and working with AI, focused on machine learning solution design and MLOps. Enthusiastic about new techs and loves contributing to open source projects. This talk will explore the concept of automated text anonymization powered by machine learning, a solution that can quickly and accurately protect sensitive data. The talk will cover all the necessary concepts and considerations to implement such a solution in the industry. Round of applause, please. Thank you. So hello everyone, once again, my name is Ivan Križanić. I'm a machine learning engineer working for Cross AI in Zagreb. And I'm uh, so happy to be here with uh, all of you today and to be able to show you how we implemented our solution for text anonymization, which for today we will call anonymization 2.0. So let's begin with defining text anonymization. Text anonymization is a process of uh, removing all sensitive and private data from a given text. And by private data, we mean really anything which can be used to identify a particular individual, organization, or really any other private entity. And here is one simple example how text anonymization works. There are two main steps. First of them being the hardest one, and that's detecting what's there to hide, what's really private information. And here I labeled my uh, name and my company, its location. And what's important to notice here is that not only highly sensitive informations like personal names, some ID numbers and so on are considered to be a private information. If you, if you have a bunch of other information about someone, you can use that as well to identify that person. So we have to be really careful what is left behind when we are doing this. The next step is the easy one, and that's how to hide this sensitive information. In this trivial example here, we just replace those texts with some predefined labels, such as, for example, here is Anon. And now the question, why are we even bothering with this? Why are we doing text anonymization? And the short answer to that is that privacy matters. We just heard that ethics in AI is important thing. And uh, truth is that companies today collect large amounts of data. And the big chunk of those data comes from us, the users. And it would be a good thing if we knew that this data won't be misused. And the fact is that companies largely use those data. They produce a great value for the business. So we could say that data today is considered to be a product. What's important thing is that although data may be a product, the data the users who own this data should never be considered and treated as a as a one. And a step in a good direction is GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation, which was introduced by European Parliament as an attempt to provide users more control over their data and in the same time to enforce a more responsible approach in using those data. And we've all heard that some major companies have already been fined because they didn't respect those laws. And it's not only financial hit they take, it's also something that is damaging their reputation. So it speaks volumes how important privacy really is in modern world. And now to get more technical, the next question is where we implemented our solution. And for us, it was a pretty easy choice. We went with the cloud. The reason for that is that cloud has some major advantages over the on-prem solutions, especially when we are talking about these modern projects, often considered to be even experimental for some companies. Cloud is extremely scalable and flexible. So if your project shows promise, company can really quickly scale it up and use it. Also, it's quite cost effective because we don't have to invest in any additional infrastructure. You just set up your cloud and you are ready to go. Cloud is also very secure and it's accessible from all around the world. 
And now the question of choosing the right cloud provider. There are many aspects you have to consider when doing this. There is a cost, there are features, some enterprise agreements, legal aspects, and so on. And firstly, our client and we went with AWS. We implemented almost everything there, but from, for some reasons, we had to move completely to Microsoft Azure, which in the end is a really good thing for us. Because now we can say that we have this amazing anonymization solution running on two major cloud providers, both AWS and Microsoft Azure. And now we know what exactly are we doing here. We know why we do it. Here comes the best question of them all. And that's how did we implement all of this. And if this was a presentation called anonymization 1.0, I would probably have to talk how we employed large number of human workers who have to manually go through texts and label them, look for the private data and so on. Maybe I would talk how we had to find the domain experts who know this language very good and who can write some precise rules which can be then used to detect private information. But those methods, although they are not as reliable and not as scalable as we would like them to, many companies still use them. But this is presentation about anonymization 2.0, so we are going to use AI, of course. And when I say AI, AI, I mean the best thing in the AI right now, large language models. All the large language models are the hottest thing right now because of amazing applications like ChatGPT and similar tools. They are not as new as you may think, at least not as new as in IT sense of word new. They're here since 2017, when uh, Google engineers published famous paper, Attention is all you need, which introduced transformer architecture. With this uh, transformer architecture, several amazing models were made. One of the most famous one being BERT. Those models, when they firstly appeared on the market, achieved state-of-the-art result in almost all tasks in natural language processing. Another great thing about large language models is that you can find a bunch of them online and use it completely free. And all uh, that we can thank to the Hugging Face. Hugging Face is an amazing open source community which not only offers a bunch of Python code you can use to download those models and plug them in your system, they also host a large number of pre-trained state-of-the-art models, which you can download and use even in commercial use cases. And that's exactly what we did. So we took a pre-trained model, but it's not, it, as, as, it's not so easy to just plug it in and use it for your purpose. You have to adapt it for a specific case because every problem has some special specialties about it. And we do that by fine tuning, which is just applying additional training to our models using some other data. And we do that in three steps. First of them is using open source datasets. So we go online and look for datasets which are free to use for commercial purposes, and we merge them, we tweak them, remove some labels and so on until we produce what is a perfect starting data set for our model. We then use those data sets to train our model and we closely watch the metrics like F1 score, precision and recall. But also we watch how our model behaves on certain examples. We watch where it has a hard time assigning labels with high confidence and where are the most of the errors coming from. And when we look at those data, we start to noticing some patterns. And by that, we were able to create some additional examples for the training. We call that a synthetic data set. So basically what we did we, is we created a large number of examples which are similar to the ones where our model has a hard time. And that improved our performance, of course, with bringing in a bit of a bias. but. As long as our models perform better on our final data sets and for our final task, it doesn't really matter. And the final step in producing a perfect model is client data. 
It would be amazing if all of the clients had their data sets prepared, but that's almost never the case. So we had to introduce data labeling process. And it may sound as a simple thing. You just hire a bunch of people, give them data, and ask them to label it for you. But it's not so easy. If you ha want to have a good result, you have to create extremely precise set of instructions. Because we humans, we are biased, and the chance that we agree in 100% of uh, cases is almost zero. And here are two simple examples I want to use to paint you a picture why the, uh, these precise instru instructions are needed. Here we have Dr. Max Weber Clinic. And somebody could say that all of this is an organization. But the other annotator could maybe say that Dr. Max Weber is a person here and clinic is organization. And then the third one could maybe say that Max Weber is a person, but doctor is just something else. Similarly, here we have Cross Zagreb. Somebody could label all of that as an organization. But in truth, Cross is organization and Zagreb is just a location. And now, even with those precise set of instructions, we don't know really how annotators are going to label this. And if we want high quality data, we have to assign each example to multiple labelers. And then we have to use what is called label consolidation, which is just a democratic process of assigning final label to the data set. So majority wins. If two, three of, or from five annotators say that CROSS is organization, then it's organization in our final data set. And now finally, we have all, all of our data sets ready. We can train what is considered to be a best model at the time. And this is just the first step in building our solution. We then asked ourselves, are there maybe any other ways that we can further improve our systems? And we looked back to some traditional approaches. Here we have a few data types which have pretty well-defined structure. So for example, phone numbers, emails, URLs, we already know how they look like. So we could just use, for example, regular expressions to detect those data types with almost 100% accuracy. So why would we, we bother uh, training our models and labeling data for that when we can use some traditional methods and do it almost perfectly? Also worth mentioning, if your client already has some big uh, lists of private information, for example, titles of some private documents, some internal numbers or whatever, why not plug that in in your system as well, just to make sure that anonym, anonymous data would, won't contain any of this. And now we combine those two subcomponents into what we call detection module. These two subcomponents give predictions, uh, separate predictions, but we have to merge them in a final result. And we do that by using confidence score. Confidence score in detection model is based just uh, from probability of assigning particular label to each example. And in rule engine, it's just a provisional number we came up with using our intuition and experience. And now when we have this detection module, which is a serious detection tool, we can finally start working on our first workflow for text anonymization. And every workflow in AI starts with the data. So we start with the data extraction. And it's worth mentioning because it's not always the case that you just get a list of documents you have to anonymize. Sometimes clients expect from you that you will connect to multiple sources, transform data, and produce something valuable even before you start with anonymization. And now when we are ready with this data extraction, we can go, to, uh, we can use our detection module, we get the prediction, but now we come to a crossroad. We asked ourselves, what if our model is not so sure about this prediction? It's, it has a low confidence for some examples. And this is where human in the loop concept comes in. So basically human in the loop functionality offers us two things. We send low confidence examples to annotators, but we also send some randomly chosen examples from the data. In this way, we practically use annotators for monitoring because maybe our model completely missed something. And in this way, annotator can see some pattern in those mistakes. 
Also, here we have one example how already predicted sentence looks like. And I, our annotators can look at that and see if there are any errors, they can correct them, or they can just submit this as a final prediction. This is a native implementation of human in the loop in AWS, with just added table of confidence scores. And in Azure, situation is a little bit different. Azure doesn't have native implementation for human in the loop. So we had to come up with something a little bit custom. And for that, we used Label Studio, which is a great open source application for data labeling, but can also be used as a human in the loop because you can send all of the labeled examples there. And we managed to integrate this into our workflow almost as it was natively there with all functionalities that AWS already had. And now we know what to do with low confidence examples. We could go on and save those data in the database and use it downstream. But that's not exactly what we do. We implement another functionality here, and it's called synthetic replacement. At the beginning of the presentation, I showed you how anonymous data could look like. But in truth, our module has this kind of output. So we, knew, we know for each entity which label it, it was assigned. We know that this was a person, this was organization, and that was a location. And of course, we could just take this data, store it in the database, and use it downstream, but we wanted to do something a little bit different. We wanted to create more natural text from the anonymized one. And we did that by replacing labeled entities with fake data. So we, uh, we got some randomly chosen names, locations, organizations, whatever we needed to, pro pro to produce this kind of text. And it, although one use of this is that it looks more natural for the down, downstream purposes, but also it provides us with another important thing. And this is another functionality we implemented into our workflow, that's the dataset generation. Now when we replace the real data with synthetically generated one, and we know which labels are assigned to those data, we practically continuously produce new data sets. And those data is no longer considered to be private, so we can store this data as long as we want, without worrying about anything. And data set generation is a really important aspect because it provides us with another functionality we can use. And this is continuous improvement. As time goes on, data changes. And that could, impact on, that could have impact on our model. It could perform worse. And that's not something we will be happy with. So we use this continuously produced data to retrain our models so that they always work as good as we expect them to. And we can do all of this without ever stopping our workflow. So this workflow is non-stop loop. And we can do all of this thanks to model registry. Model registry is another important concept we use. And it's using another a great open source application called MLflow. And what we can do with this model registry is that we can have multiple versions of the same model registered there but with different stages assigned to them. So one version of the model could be a testing version, another one could be a production version. And when we retrain our models and produce a new version of a model, we can compare it to the previous ones. If it performs better or good enough, our system will know that this will be considered to be a production version, and in the next iteration of pipeline, it will be used as a produ production model. If maybe this model is not good enough, it will be just saved in the registry for some other time. This also allows us to easily implement testing pipelines because the only thing we have to change if, if, in all of this is maybe destination where this data goes and the, the stage of our model we want to use. And with that, we have continuously self-improving, uh, uh, well-performing anonymization system and now our client can finally relax and use this user data for downstream purposes. For example, they can do sentiment analysis, topic modeling, summarization, semantic search, or whatever brings new additional values to them without worrying that they will break user privacy or any legislation. And I could say that 
such application is crucial for every company that wants to use user data to produce additional value. And now to conclude this presentation, I will just point to four main takeaways about our system. First of them being that machine learning workloads in cloud are a great solution, especially when we are talking about these modern, often experimental projects. If this project shows to be a promising one, companies can quickly scale them up and use them. If, unfortunately, companies may be not yet ready to implement such a solution, you can shut it all down without worrying that you are leaving any infrastructure left behind. Also, worth mentioning is that although we all love AI and AI solves a bunch of our problems, there is no reason to forget about some traditional methods. Maybe we can use some of them to further improve our systems with low cost. Another great thing is that it seems that AI is always trying to push humans out of the workflows. But we find a way to bring humans back into our workflow. And this is by using human in the loop. Human in the loop allows us to monitor our system because annotators can check some randomly chosen examples. It serves to produce a more reliable solution because we send low confidence examples to annotators. And finally, it produ continuously pro produces more data for us so th that we can go to the fourth point of that, and that's continuous improvement. It's very important for us that we don't deliver products which work great on the first day, but become worse as time goes by. We want to deliver products which improve themselves with as low as maintenance as possible. And with that, I'll finish with my presentation. Thank you for being here and for listening. If you have any questions, I'm open to them now or after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, did you uh, uh, evaluate the um, uh, performance of the model separately, like only the uh, language, uh, the, the large language model classification, only the static rules and everything together? Did you have any comparison of how it would perform without these parts that compose the whole workflow? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we did do that. And uh, it showed uh, that it's a little bit more to produce a stable and reliable solution if we rely on some traditional methods as well. Emails, phone numbers, URLs are really easy to catch with such rules. So, of course, we compared two approaches and this one was better for us and more effective. Just follow up, uh, but what was the magnitude of the difference? I mean, I, I, I imagine that it's better, but I'm just curious of how much better was it and how much we would perform without those rules. Yeah, well, uh, the most important thing for us in this use case is to detect information. So we don't want to have false negatives. And in that sense, it performed quite better because it catches almost 100% of those those specific data types. So it certainly improved recall. But when we watch uh, maybe F1 score, it wasn't so dramatic. But of course, it was impactful for us and we decided to go with it. Thank you. Uh, my question is how many uh, humans in the loop do you need and how often do you return the model? Uh, did you return it more often in the beginning and now uh, less frequently or? Yeah, thank you. Well, initial idea is maybe to have just one human in the loop per each example. But if sometimes we maybe decide that we can invest a little bit more in that and to produce more reliable data, we could go with maybe three. But for now, it looks like one is completely uh, okay. And the next part of your question was, uh, how often do we retrain our models? And that's also something that's not yet quite decided uh, in some concrete numbers, but we think that maybe two times amount 
uh, per month will be completely okay. Thank you. And how, how did you deploy the transformer model to production? They're not always um, easy to manipulate with in terms of model size. Yeah, well, we're just using uh, Azure infrastructure right now and it's deployed using machine learning uh, workspace. So really there is no problem uh, considering the resources. You just pay for the larger larger uh, instance and that's all you need. Thank you. Thank you.